Okay, folks. Um, I'd imagine they're running a little bit behind in the other room, so we might be getting some people streaming in, but I want to give you as much time as possible with our next speaker. Uh, Karsten Januszewski is going to talk to you about bringing gamification to software developers. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so, my name is Karsten Januszewski, work for Microsoft, and Last year, or early this year really, we released a add-in to Visual Studio, uh, bringing gamification to this product. If you're not familiar with Visual Studio, it's an integrated development environment for the Microsoft platform. It's a software a tool for building software. It's the AutoCAD for software developers, or the Photoshop, or the Office. As a software engineer, I've lived in this tool for the last 10 years. It's on my desktop day in and day out. Um, it's installed millions and millions of developers, use it all over the world. Um, it's been around since the 90s. It's a very established product. So we wanted to bring gamification to Visual Studio. Um, like I said, we released it early this year, 2012. It's been very, very successful. It's been downloaded over 100,000 times. And basically, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, well, how it works, and then I want to get into some of the lessons learned that we learned from building this that you may be able to take away, because I don't know how many of you are interested in the actual um, mechanics of how this works, but more about how you might be able to take what we did and apply it to what you're doing. Uh, so briefly, though, the way it works is when a developer installs this extension, um, it then starts analyzing their behavior both how they use the tool and then, most interestingly, when they compile their source code, this extension analyzes their source code and looks for different patterns, different behaviors, and then gives you achievements based on what it sees. These achievements pop up in your lower screen, so it's very much like a, an Xbox game or World of Warcraft, and then it gets reported to a server, so classic style, you get a badge, um, and then you get on the leaderboard depending how many points you get. So all very much from the basic playbook of gamification. Our motivations for doing it were really two, threefold. Um, one was to reward the often lonely work of developing. So often, you, as a software developer, I often say that no one really cares what you do until there's a bug. And uh, you have so many moments of glory as a coder that nobody ever sees. You're just you pull off something and no one knows, no one cares. It just gets compiled and ships. So we wanted to somehow recognize this work that developers do and allow them to show off through you know, these public badges, their achievements. We also wanted to bring some levity and some fun to the often not fun task of coding. So we have a lot of fun achievements. Um, you can see I've got one there, lonely. You get an achievement if you're coding on a Friday or Saturday night. We've got potty mouth if you use curse words in your files. And so we, we wanted to bring some fun both to you know, the engineering process and also show kind of another side of, of Microsoft and show that we, can, we have a sense of humor as well. And then the third reason we did it was, as I said up here, the product-based achievements. So we wanted to use this as a tool to introduce features that people might not even know were in the product or have, encourage them to do things that they might not otherwise do by motivating them with all the things that everyone knows about in terms of gamifying. Uh, but I think more interestingly is I would just wanted to get some of the lessons learned that uh, having shipped this piece of software, and this is kind of all new to me and my team, you know, a lot of the folks that, that in the, a lot of coders are gamers. So we all knew achievements from video games and whatnot. So we had that as a foundation, but it was still, we, we, we learned a lot doing this, and I wanted to share some of those with you. Um, so the first is listen to your community, listen to your customer. Um, it's a cliche that we've heard throughout the conference already, and you hear day in, day out, but it's worth saying again. And in this case, I think it's worth calling out um, an example of how this all played out. The community came up with this idea in the first place. We didn't even come up with this idea. It started as a blog post, it got picked up on Reddit, and all these people on Reddit started chiming in, hey, yeah, what if Visual Studio had achievements? What if it had this achievement? What if it had that achievement? 
And in fact, they came up with so many great ideas, just hilarious, because they're developers, uh, that we took their ideas and then implemented them. And in fact, after we shipped, we were like, hey guys, look, we built what you asked for. And they said, wow, that's cool. And some guys would say, hey, they built my achievement in. you know. And since we've shipped, they've come up with more achievement ideas. And so it, you know, we would have never even done this if it weren't for the community. And you can get a lot of IP from your community for free. So listen to them. They'll have better ideas than you will. I guarantee it. And um, it just can't be said enough that when you go out and ask them what they want, they'll tell you, and then you can go build it. The next thing I want to talk about are negative achievements. So by negative achievements, and I haven't heard too much about this in this conference thus far, um, but I haven't gone to every session. Negative achievements are when you get an achievement or you're rewarded for bad behavior, for doing something negative, unhealthy, whatnot. And we built a whole series of negative achievements into the product. Now we uh, gave them zero points, so we tried to call them out very clearly, like you're not getting rewarded for this, you get a badge for it, but you don't get any points for this. And you know, there were a lot of, there were really funny achievements if you're a coder. So we came up with lots of practices, things that um, you would probably never do in your source code, but we would reward, not reward you, we would acknowledge it with an achievement if you did it. And it turned out there was a big backlash to this that we were not anticipating. Um, I wasn't anticipating it, that we got beat up by a fair number of people after we shipped this who said, you're encouraging bad practices, um, you're, you're taking something that's very serious, that's engineering, and you're, you're, you're turning it into something negative. Um, I wasn't anticipating that. And so we ultimately reconciled this by feeling like we made the right call in doing this. Um, I think negative achievements add a lot of fun, they add some humor, and ultimately if you don't, if you aren't smart enough to realize that this is a bad coding practice, you shouldn't be coding in the first place. So I feel like they were warranted, but I still wish that I would have anticipated the backlash we got before we had to sort of react retroactively. So as you're designing your achievement systems, negative achievements, think about if you want to do them. They'll definitely be controversial. Controversy isn't a bad thing. Um, so, but you might want to be, uh, anticipate what might happen if you do negative achievements in advance, which we did not do. And the final thing I wanted to talk about is cheating, which I believe there's a whole presentation on cheating um, coming up. But it's a game. People will try and game the system. It's just as obvious as day. And if you aren't thinking about how people will try and cheat or game your system in advance, then um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And we did do this, actually. You know, it's, uh, the woman who spoke uh, before me, she talked about one, one way to handle cheating is to build it into your system. Um, we, didn't, we chose not to go down that route, but I think it's a really interesting route psychologically and from a game perspective. Um, if, you can, if you have the opportunity to make cheating part of your game, I think it's really interesting. Uh, we, we chose not to do that just because um, um, we, wanted to, we knew people were probably going to try and hack us, and so we wanted to just be rock solid so that you know, if, if if we were hacked, we wanted to, that, that would not be good. So we spent a lot of time doing what's called a threat model. And you know, in a lot of software practices, you have a moment in the design phase where you do a threat model to your software. And you sit in a room, you bring everyone together, and you brainstorm every possible way that software can be hacked. You turn into a hacker yourself, and you come up with all the attack vectors on your software. So in our case, this turned out to be pretty tricky. Because here we were a plug-in on the desktop of the developer themselves. So the developer has access to that plug-in, him or herself. So we had to think about, all right, how, what, are the, what are the ways they can hack that? Uh, one way is that 
they could hack the store itself. We work offline, so as you earn achievements, they get put in a store. Uh, so a developer could very easily go hack that store and then say, hey, you know, I earned seven achievements instead of eight, six. Uh, they could also hack the, the, the message being sent from the client to the server. So um, basically look at the transmission between the client and the server, look at what that message looks like, and then replicate that message with their own message and send it to the server. There's also hacking the server itself. We were less concerned about that, uh, but we, um, um, just because we were using a server backend that had been up for 10 years and weren't too concerned about that. But that's still an attack vector. And then one of the uh, attack vectors that we haven't really solved, I'll get into this in a sec, is that somebody could get a project that earns all the achievements and download it and then just compile it and that would earn them all the achievements. Um, so anyway, we have some mitigation for that. So the way we handle these attack vectors, uh, the way we secure the client is with, uh, this gets a little wonky, but I'm an engineer so I can't help it, uh, is we use HMAC cryptography. It's basically hashing the messages. Um, so we both use HMACs on the store itself and on all the messages. The really tricky thing about that is that if you're familiar with how HMACs work and with that particular hashing algorithm, it requires a shared secret. So we need a secret that's on the server and on the client. So that means the secret itself is sitting on every single machine that if the hacker gets that secret or if the developer gets that secret, they, can, they could hash the message successfully. So we actually keep a secret on the client and that was some of the most interesting code I've written. I can't share how we do it, but we actually managed to s store a secret on the client, and we haven't been hacked yet. We have not been hacked yet. I know because I put a bunch of honeypots in that code, so if you start going down the path of trying to find the secret and hack and play with secrets, we'll find you. That's another thing you can do with cheating. I wanted to make an achievement if you get to my honeypots, but we didn't do that. Um, the other thing you can do to mitigate server attacks, uh, both is, and this is how we deal with the, if someone just downloads a project and compiles it, is look at the server logs and do basically look at the, re look at the see if there's a replay we can clearly see. So if you get 10 achievements in 10 seconds, we know you're probably cheating. So we can look at that and, um, and I would encourage you to think about, it's a pretty common technique out there uh, to detect cheats in your system. Um, so, yeah, in the end, it's been a really fun project. We released our first version. We've already released uh, additional achievements. We've got teams inside the company that want us to make more achievements. So different folks will say, hey, will you add achievements for our product or for our technology? And um, we'll probably keep running with this, it seems to be. Seems to be popular. Humans are motivated by games. There's no doubt about that. That's it. Thanks awesome. a lot. Thank you so much. Um, technically, we don't really have time for questions, but this is such a unique perspective and not one we're hearing a lot about uh, at the conference. So I want to make time for a couple questions. Yeah. Okay. What were your goals? Um, for gamifying Visual Studio? Was it just that it was something cool that we were doing around the edges, or was there a perceived problem with the, the development environment that you were trying to make it more competitive against another development stack? Uh, so the question, if you couldn't hear it, was what was the motivation? Was it just to do something fun and cool, or was there a perceived threat that would make you, that, that you were doing this for? Definitely more the latter. I mean, the more the latter, did I say that? Definitely more the former, not the latter. So we, we, it, this is an add-in. I'm actually not on the official Visual Studio team. I'm on the uh, kind of a team that does special projects. So we did this as an add-in. It's not an official part of the product. It's an uh, optional install. Um, so it, it's, it's done more for fun. Hey. Yeah. Wanted to ask, uh, what team do you actually work on? I think you, be ba you began to answer that, and I asked because I wanted to see how you engage with the massive enterprise that is Microsoft, and how you start to see how you can incentivize the use of different tools and new development cycles that may plug into the overall framework. 
uh, I'm in a similar enterprise situation where there are a bunch of independent product lines that I want to unify through gamification and just any lessons learned on that path. I'm fortunate enough to be on a team inside Microsoft that's kind of recognizes that there is that problem, if you will, and so encourages us to try and think outside of the box. Um, so it's, uh, um, I'm on the Channel 9 team, for what it's worth, which is a website that's a community for developers on the Microsoft platform, and then we do special projects to appeal to that community. So it was, in this, so I guess to answer your question, it was, that problem was sort of institutionally solved in that people saw the need for a group that thinks outside of the box, and that's what we, got to, that's what we get to do. Excellent. Uh, we have one more super quick question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Hi. Thanks. Yeah, interesting. Um, what, so what's, uh, excuse me if you answered this partially, but it, what, what's the next steps you guys are going to take with this? Uh, so the, the question was, what are the next steps? Um, so since we released this, we've, like I said, had a lot of um, people coming to us and want to add their achievements to our product, especially things that are new and aren't as well known. So that's probably what we'll be doing is focusing on um, that. But then I also feel like if we do nothing but just those kind of achievements, we aren't listening to our community. So I also want to go back and, um, and implement some of the achievements that the community has come up with. So we need to always be keeping a balance. And I, I think that's a good point. Is, you need to have like the fun with the medicine, and so I always want to keep this project a balance of fun and medicine, if you will. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you, Karsten.